Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the Tuesday lunch. My name is Joe Tag. I'm the moderator for the spring semester, and so I have the honor of introducing our speakers for today: Max Goldman in classics, and Rebecca Kennedy, also in classics, also administrative director of the Denison Museum, and it's also Rebecca's birthday today. And I. <laughs> I just <laughs> I wanted to personally thank her for not canceling her Tuesday lunch and me finding her under the flagpole on a blanket. So happy birthday. And um, Max and Rebecca will be talking to us today about teaching in Rome, no classroom required. Is this working? Is yours working? So, um, what we thought we'd do today is talk to you a little bit at the beginning about the course and then give a couple of case studies or walk you through the day of what we're doing with the students uh, and um, then look at some of the assignments we have and how we organize the course. Teaching out of the classroom, teaching on site, um, presents challenges um, for everybody involved, uh, students and faculty uh, as well, but it also gives many opportunities. And one of the things that we're very conscious of as we, as we put together the course is thinking about how can we make use of all these opportunities that we have, and as many of them as possible. Um, one example of this is uh, we have the students, um, when we're in Rome, arrive on the spot where we're going to be teaching. That is, we do not take them from the hotel to the spot. We have them get there on their own. We give them um, bus passes. Um, but we put it on them to, we're going to meet at the Pyramid of Cestius at 9.30 tomorrow morning. And um, we uh, ask them to get there on their own. And it's terrifying for them at first, uh, but very quickly they learn how to navigate the city. And Rome has some difficulties, but it's pretty well um, serviced by public transportation. Likewise, we end our day's lessons on site as well, so that the students then have to get back on their own. Um, and this allows them to feel, after a few days, like they have the freedom of the city, which is something that's important for us. So this is one place where we think about how are we going to get from place A to point B, but also how can we use that to help further some of our goals um, in the teaching. Um, one other example of something we build into the course, because we're on site and because what we want to do is train the students in a way to be better um, at looking at things. How can you improve your ability to see? Um, and like with reading, I think one of the things you need to do is slow down. So we ask the students every day at least one item that they see they need to sketch. And they have a visual sketchbook. Um, now, this is also something that terrifies students because many of us are embarrassed at how bad we are at drawing. Um, but the point is not being a good artist, but it's being a good looker. So you have to slow down. And so we actually grade them not on the quality of their design or their drawing, but on a little comment at the bottom of something they were able to notice or something that came to them as they were, as they were drawing an object. We emphasize we don't judge. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> mm -hmm. So 
these are just sort of little things that I think uh, building into the course to help uh, make it feel sort of coherent and have all and get all of our um, our goals done. There are essentially three topics that we like to talk about regularly throughout the um, course. Um, and this is sort of under three headings. Interpretation. This is the one most people think about when they think about um, studying on site. Like, what do we know? How do we know what we know about this image? What was its meaning for the original um, population? But uh, because we're actually on site, we like to talk also about <laughs> preservation. How did it get to us now, and how do we keep it the way it is? Um, one thing that's part of archaeology is that when you pull something out of the ground, it then starts to degrade. So this is something we want to think about consciously. What does it mean to do this? Um, and so this um, preservation, but also how is it presented in its, in its context of the moment? Right? Um, what choices are made? How, what sort of signs are put up um, to let people understand what they're seeing or what aren't? Or what kind of signs aren't put up? Or what signs aren't put up? Um, and how is this material then sort of presented? And this goes not just when you're on site, but also more um, importantly in museums. Um, what do you choose to represent? How is it organized? So these um, are things that uh, uh, we think are important since we're studying the ancient world in the modern city. And one of the things we always have to think about as well is in terms of preservation and presentation is how do they decide what's worth digging out? How do they decide what's worth digging through and destroying? Because archaeology is controlled destruction mm -hmm. um, in many ways. So the idea is that you have to decide you know, which part of the layering of the city is the more important part and why is it the more important part. So why is it that classical Rome is more important than Renaissance or medieval um, or 19th century? Um, and then how do they, when they do decide to display, if they do decide to display layers, how do they do that and how do they privilege what kind of knowledge is considered more important than others? So that's another aspect that we ask them to think about as we're in the sites because you can see the sites layered and the history sort of of each site. Mm -hmm. So I think with those three things we can look at um, one of our days and work through, um, work through it with the help um, of of our students. Of our students, who's, who have a job. You know, two of them, every day, the document the day. They're the historians of that day. They talk about what we did, um, and they think that their job then is to present a record of that day, of our activities. And so, um, there we are. Ah, there we go. Okay. So this day, day four, we're at the Pyramid of Cestius. Um, Monte Testaccio and the um, Monte Martini Power Plant Museum, the three um, sites that we see. You can see with the students, they, they say, we proceeded to board our bus late, but we still managed to arrive early for our 9.30 tour. They're making it, right? And they're commenting, like, we had to do it ourselves. We got there, though. Uh, getting, getting somewhere on time in Rome is also uh, a good success there. Um, so the Pyramid of Cestius, if you're not aware of this, it is a giant marble. Um, I can't make it move, Duffy. Uh, a giant marble uh, pyramid to, um, in Rome. And sort of stands out pretty remarkably uh, when you're there. Um, it has a lot of interesting features for us uh, as our, in our studies because we can date it pretty um, accurately. Um, and one of the things we do, and you can see me up there pointing, which is what I do a lot. I, I have a whole set of images that the students have been cracking about, and they're those live movie, live photos that they move of Max pointing at things. The students have put together a whole series of Max pointing, and he has different, <laughs> different pointing techniques. Yeah. Like <laughs> which I was not aware of until they showed them to me. <laughs> So I'm pointing here to the inscription on the monument, which is uh, and helping them work through understanding and reading it. 
and um, helping us uh, to date it. But one of the things we talk about with Kestius is not just what it meant to have this pyramid, and the students talk about that there in theirs, but we also talk about um, why is it still here? Um, the edge of the pyramid right um, here. <laughs> it was built into the Aurelian walls in the third, uh, the end of the third century AD and maintained, but its purpose was forgotten. In the Middle Ages, they thought it was the, the tomb of Remus. There happened to be another giant pyramid over by the Vatican area, which they thought was the tomb of Romulus. Um, uh, the, neither of those were correct, and it wasn't until the 17th century when they cleared the dirt off of it that they were able to read the inscription and figure out who it was. Um, you can see a picture of it there. If you go today and see it, it's beautiful, clean and shiny. Um, but if you were there two years ago, it would have been covered in scaffolding because it was being cleaned. Uh, and uh, for a long time before that happened, like so when I was there, um, it started being cleaned in 2013. So before 2013, the thing was brown, looked horrible. And many people believed that it was because it was in a, a roadway and it had um, all that uh, smog on it. But in fact, it was a fungus that was growing all over it. Um, so they took a couple of years to clean it. But this is, I think, one of the interesting things when we talk about this. This was paid for primarily by a gift by a Japanese businessman who gave $1 million for the cleaning of this monument. Rome has probably, uh, I think, the most UNESCO World Heritage Sites, or not Rome, Italy has the most UNESCO World Heritage Sites of any country, yet they do not have the resources to maintain them. Uh, and so this is a question we want the students to think about. What does it mean to have this incredible patrimony, but how are you going to maintain it? Um, so it's beautiful now, um, and we make special um, permissions. Um, you can't just go in, um, but if you get a permission, you can go in, uh, and we do. And when you're inside, which you have some pictures of there, you see that the tomb has actually been robbed. Uh, and so that again lets the students continue to think about preservation um, and presentation. Uh, but it also has, as one of the students comments on their blog, the earliest example of third style wall painting, which is what you see in here. Um, and why is this important for us? It's because we can actually date this into a tomb that was closed in 12 BC. So we know third style wall painting existed in 12 BC, since otherwise we would not. It's closed into a tomb. So that's in the interpretation area. Um, and then cats. of course, cats. <laughs> the cats of Rome are sort of a theme. Um, they're everywhere. The students so chase them around. We get to go in. We get to see this um, remarkable thing. Um, and as it's not here, but as we walk around, we're actually right next to the um, it's often called the Protestant Cemetery, more exactly, the non-Catholic cemetery. Um, uh, and uh, there we can see, um, just on our way past, as we walk by, we stop and we see uh, the grave of Keats um, as well. So there's always these little opportunities, particularly in Italy, but in Rome, and many places you go, if you're just on passing, you can see things um, as well. Yeah. Yep. Should I move faster? A little bit. I'm okay. Going to dawdle. Um, the Montemartini Power Plant Museum, did you want to talk about this? Yeah, I'll talk. This is actually my favorite museum in the world. Um, so one of the things we do on the same day is we take the students to the Montemartini Power Plant Museum. And um, it's called the Power Plant Museum because it's actually in a power plant. Um, this was a power plant that was built in the 1930s, I think. Um, and it wasn't being used. And then for a, a sort of the Capitoline Museum had an excess of artworks. And they decided to do a one-time show there. Um, and it was considered so compelling that they decided to make it into a permanent museum. So what they've done, and you can see from the student's picture here, is you have all of these ancient sculptures set up against this 1930s power plant and distributed throughout of it. So you have this contrast that's being made between the ancient and the, and the still ancient, but <laughs> less ancient um, power plant technology. Um, and so this is one of the things that we, in the museums that we go into, and we can ask the students to really think about, what is the force of this presentation? Um, that, they're tr that they're putting forth here. What, what, how, do, how do you see that contrast? And importantly, this also brings us into what, what we'll look at um, in a few moments, which is um, fascist Italy and how fascist Italy and ancient Rome and modern Italy and ancient, modern Rome all intersect at all times um, within these <coughs> environments. 
But also importantly, um, something that comes up in this museum and then it comes up again later when we go into what the students termed the, the fanciest bathtub um, in the world, the Baths of Diocletian, is that many of the works of art that are on display here are in fact tombs. Um, and so you have to ask the question, when does something move from being a tomb to a work of art? Um, and this gets to the heart of where museums themselves originate, which is they originate in two spaces, in colonialism and in connoisseurship. Right? The private collector and the movement of the private collector who is pulling works out of Italy, pulling works out of Greece, pulling works out of Egypt and the Near East, and then moving them into spaces that are not their natural habitats. So a continuing theme uh, that we go through throughout the course is works in their natural spaces, such as in Cestius's tomb, versus works that have been pulled out of their context and recontextualized, sometimes in a pretty extravagantly different way, as with the power plant. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. The, um... We take them to pastries as well. Yeah, Andre <laughs> Ote, which is nearby here, is one of my favorite pastry shops in Rome. And so, we make a stop. This is the other thing we teach them in Rome, is where the really good food is. <laughs> And cheap. <laughs> and then the last bit, we get a special um, permesso to climb up Monte Testaccio. Uh, Monte Testaccio is not one of the famous seven hills of Rome. It is a um, pile of trash. It's a pile of trash. <laughs> it is a man made hill of about 100 years of amphora or um, big clay pots that are broken and piled up on top of each other. Uh, right here. And so you can see a piece there, but the whole hill is just a hill of broken pot shards. And we get to walk up this hill and look at the various pot shards and talk about them. But what it does is it serves us as an incredible way of talking about what kind of city is Rome um, in the standard consumer model. It is a city that brings material from abroad and consumes it in the city. It's not producing things and sending them out. It's bringing them in and consuming them. And then and you have to deal with the trash that's And then you left have, behind. of course, all the trash. Um, the students often like this one because um, we're able to um, actually touch the, the uh, shards. We have to them. make sure everyone has their tetanus shot before they go with us to Rome. Um. Yeah. <laughs> this is one of the places where we say you must wear closed-toed shoes as you walk up the mountain of trash. Um, <laughs> okay. So that's, that's a day, and we probably would finish that day around two, um, and then we usually live, let the students go um, to explore the city on their own. But we at Monte de Statue say, okay, we're done. You know where we're going for the next day. Now you can go and explore. If you, we can't see it here, but on the website I have a list of things that they might consider doing in that area at that time. So that's sort of an average day for us. Um, Sometimes we're together with the students from four hours, sometimes it's 10 hours, sometimes it's more. <laughs> um, so you're sort of really compacted together. Um, but one of the things um, I wanted to look at is this issue of uh, this particular monument that we take the students with, because this really gets to the heart of this intersection of the ancient and the modern um, in a way that a lot of the other sites don't necessarily do it so explicitly. Um, and this one is the Arapacus. So the Arapacus is a famous, we're not quite sure what it was, it was an altar dedicated to peace. Um, by the Emperor Augustus. Um, and it was located um, here uh, in what was the campus, Martius. Now this building on the left, which on the, this is right, <laughs> my left, um, is the new fancy museum that was built for it not too long ago. Um, in the 1930s, Mussolini built a sort of, had a, a, a different type of museum covering built for it in its location um, after it was excavated but they've now built a new fancy museum that's all light, so you can see on the inside it's completely all windows and all light so that you can see it in its natural space. Um, the altar was originally painted, and so one night a week they actually do a light show that projects the original paint colors onto the monument because most people think that ancient Roman sculpture was white. It wasn't. It was very brightly colored, blues and reds and greens and golds. Um, and so they do this light show. So this is a, a preservation technique that you can think about that it doesn't actually damage the work as it is. It doesn't involve touching up or restoring the work, but it allows people to see it in its original um, version as it would have been. Uh, but more importantly is the neighborhood in which this is located that we try to point the students out because Mussolini built this up as a very important location. It was called the Piazza. Um, 
Augusto Imperatore, and surrounding it are these buildings, which are done in the sort of severe modernist style of the fascist architecture, but it has um, friezes and different types of iconography that are uh, meant to actually mirror, um, in some ways, the Augustan and Roman styles, with the friezes of workers, um, idealized workers, farmers, um, people working. You see the fasces over here with an inscription with a mosaic belt into the top. So it's modeling certain aspects of ancient Rome, building itself into the environment with the ancient Romans and co-opting the ancient Roman city into the fascist um, dream of the city. Now, I'm actually going to be teaching a class on this in the fall, so if you guys are interested, mm -hmm. <laughs> let me know, um, on this way that these classical works are appropriated by nationalist movements and fascist um, governments. Um, and here you can actually see it in action. Um, it was a big deal when Hitler went to visit Mussolini um, at one point. Mussolini took him to visit the Arapacus because he treated this as one of the sort of most important monuments in his city. This is a really great photo of Mussolini and Hitler getting a tour of the altar itself after it had been excavated. So, so there is a problem that we have in Pompeii when we visit them. Um, we are legally allowed to, um, as university sponsored trip, to bring our students through the city. That doesn't mean the guides will not harass you if you try to do it, and will call the police because it doesn't cost them anything and it can get you into trouble. So, so, he's, so in, in Italy, you have to use a guide, a paid guide, a professional guide, to take you into places unless you are an educational institution. You can't be amateur guide, right? And so, but in any case, we have a problem. So we have to solve this problem. Um, there's two, we solved it in two ways. Um, but the first um, is that we actually send the students in without us with a sheet where they have to reenact a day in Rome, a day in Pompeii. So they have a sheet where they have to visit certain houses as if they are local residents. And they we go We make them through, bathe when they first they get have to there. Go, <laughs> and it's, it's set up as a typical Roman day. And they walk through the city. This is their first time in this city, and they walk through it as if they've just come back to the city, and they have to bathe, they have to find their patron, they have to go to a play, and they have to do it on their own. And they spend most of the morning um, living, living a day in Rome. So, in, so here in they groups. are in a bath. Mm -hmm. Here they are watching a, a movie. They're in a brothel here, by yeah. the way. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think they, they, um, they labeled this photo in their assignment, uh, paint me like one of your French girls. Um, so. <laughs> um, and so we have them do that, and um, we meet them inside at the end and talk about their experiences. Um, and then I have a, um, a friend who is also a licensed guide and a working archaeologist at Pompeii. Um, and I have him then, I contract with him to do the second part of the tour, and I'd like to do it with him, part because we know each other, but also because I can tell to him, we're really interested in preservation at Pompeii. We're really interested in the way this thing is presented. Can you focus on these issues? And he will. He knows the material well, and he will work with us to make and sure that we on, do what we want to do. Yeah, he actually works on part of one of the teams that is doing conservation work at the site, so he's intimately involved with it. So it's really great to have his expertise. Mm -hmm. So um, this is how we get around a problem and make it work for us on our, on our course. Now one of the things, of course, that happens when you go into a city like Pompeii, and this is actually from the city of Herculaneum, one of the lesser known sites, though spectacular, that was actually covered by the same explosion. But this one was covered by about 20 meters of sludge, <laughs> um, as opposed to ashfall. And one of the things that you're confronted with, it's not just daily life in the city, but it's how those cities ended. Um, and then how that is presented. So when you go into the city of Herculaneum, you sort of go through and tour the city, and then you make your way down to the docks in the same way that the residents would have done on their last day trying to get out of the city as these explosions are happening and the sludge is um, moving towards them quickly. And for centuries, people thought that the residents of this city had gotten out. And then as they slowly moved their excavations down further and further, they finally got down to the docks, and this is what they found. And it's a very uncomfortable thing. You go and you think you treat these, some tourists treat these sites as kind of a Disneyland-esque experience, where they're going to see these exciting things, and then you realize that these are cities that have died. 
uh, some of them in very extreme ways. Um, and you should see how people, it's, it's really interesting to sort of see how these different people react and respond to this moment. Um, most of it is a lot of discomforted laughing um, and joking around and trying to sort of light, liven up, you know, lighten up this extreme expression mm -hmm. that they're, they're engaging with death in this really real way. But this is what archaeology and history is. History is civilizations that no longer exist. Um, and it's abstracted until you're confronted with it. Just like I asked the question, we go into Kestius' tomb, but Kestius' tomb is empty. You're not confronted with it. You see tombstones in museums. You're not confronted with it. And then you go into a site, and here it is. After you've been spending the day touring the city, seeing these beautiful homes that they lived in, seeing the taverns that they ate in, um, seeing the baths that they worked in, mm -hmm. and then you see what, what the end result of that city was. Um, and it's, it's, very, it's very much more powerful than something. These photos don't do it justice, um, as, as painful as they are to look at. And this is one reason, because we want the students to think about Sorry, this, this one's a little racy. That we, we focus on presentation. <laughs> what does it mean to present it like that? OK. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so this is a photo I actually show in my classes a lot. Um, I'm a classicist, what am I supposed to do? I teach gender and sexuality um, as one of my classes. I also teach Pompeii and Herculaneum. And one of the things that's really important for students to understand is that they are different from us. They are not us. They don't have the same sexual mores, gender rules, gender roles, um, rules about, and laws governing the lives of women, um, transsexuals, et cetera. They are different. And sometimes they don't get it. I show this picture in class as we're talking about different sexual mores. And I say, guys, this is actually a picture from the entranceway to someone's home. And they're like, whatever, you're, you're crazy. No, I'm not. This is a picture from the entrance to someone's home. When you see a picture in isolation and you see it in a museum wall, it's very different. You can not believe its context. You can think that this is somewhere something that would be hidden that's pornographic by this culture. But then you walk into the front door of this home, and there it is. And it's only in that moment, one of the students who I'd had in a class where we had talked about this image, and then he came to Rome with us, he just looked at me and goes, I see what you mean. Mm -hmm. Because all of a sudden, you're actually confronted with the reality that this isn't pornographic to a, Ro to a Pompeian mm -hmm. or to a Roman. Um, this is just, this, this is a symbolic image that has a lot of heft to it. It's about mm -hmm. wealth. It's about fertility. It's about power. Mm -hmm. It's not about right. sex. It's right there, right? That's the front door. That's what you see when you go visit this guy's house, <laughs> first thing. Um, but this also leads us to thinking about the issue of museums. Again, because these, oh, I don't want this one. Go back to this. When you go into the museums um, to see these exact same images, this is something that just came up last week. Um, it just went live on the internet, and it's like the greatest thing ever, because this museum is impossible to work with to actually get permission to publish images. And now they're all, their, their catalog is online, so it's fantastic. Um, but these images, like the one that you just saw, are in a secret room in the museum. It's called the secret room. <laughs> um, <laughs> right? The um, Gabinetto Secreto. Yeah, it's, it's a... What they did was... Secret cabinet. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Well, obviously, in this, these are large cities. They found a lot of material that we would consider that they considered, in, when they discovered them in the 18th, 19th century, that these were erotic. So they took them all and put them in one little room. So the effect is kind of overwhelming. Like you got all of the erotica from cell cities in a tiny room stacked up on top of each other. But one of the things you realize when you start to see is that how many of these are wall paintings that would have been in people's homes, sculptures, but the things I love are the things that, that would have just been hanging around their house publicly, like flying penis oil lamps. Because who doesn't want one? <laughs> um, right? And there are dozens of them in this little location because they found them all over the city. Here's another. These are oil lamps, right? Um, this is just sort of how they rolled. And so the students have to actually confront a very different set of sexual mores um, and habits. And it doesn't really sink home until they have to see it confronted in this way. The other thing that they see then, of course, is that you'll notice from this catalog, this one says Villa of the Papyri. This one says Pompeian Collection. This one says Other Provinces. And then you have up here the Farnese Collection. 
So the question is, where do all of these come from? These all come from private collections and they've been removed from their sites and they've been populated into a museum in Naples. And some of the removal from the sites involved drilling down into the sites before they were excavated just to find pieces of sculpture, right? We wanted to find stuff that could go on the market. We have actual documentation from um, buyers and collectors from the 18th and 19th century who were commissioning, hey, you're taking a trip to Italy. Can, if you go, can you find me some, you know, I want some, you know, an athletic nude. I would like something for my garden. Mm -hmm. I'd really love to have a nice bust for this location. And so they would go and they would drill down into these unexcavated dig sites and, and find them and pull them out. Um, and then they would go onto the market and then you would never see them again. And this is actually one reason why when you go into some museums, you don't see little placards that tell you where they come from because they can't tell you where they <laughs> came from. Um, they lack provenance. Um, this has become a big deal now, of course, because of the black markets. Um, and since UNESCO passed a law in the 1970s uh, banning this practice. But a lot of these museums and a lot of these, these sites have been depopulated of their original works and we will never know where they were actually located originally. Um, so this is something else we sort of try to get the students to really think about when you go to a museum. When you look at someone's private art, if you have access to a private collection, um, what does that mean? And how do these collections get built? And what is the history of colonialism that lies behind this? Because the people who had most of this collection, he was a foreign king in Italy, wasn't a local. Go back to your slide. Yeah, wrap it up. Um, so the last thing we have is we just wanted to share some student comments. Unfortunately, um, the class takes place in the summer, but the grades don't go in until the following fall, and so then we have to like try and wrestle them up to get them to do evals, which is not easy. So <laughs> only like five of them did the evals. Um, but these are some of the comments that they made about the experience of being on site um, and what it means to sort of interweave the modern and the ancient and be in a living city studying a, a no longer living part of that city. Um, so we just thought we'd share some of those with you um, and then show you our pictures. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and that's it. Thank you.